MIT is known around the world as an incubator for technological breakthroughs and scientific discoveries. Many of these have become indispensable parts of our everyday lives, from the transistor radio to the World Wide Web, from Technicolor to e-ink, and from military radar to friendly robots. But one of MIT's major firsts in particular should warm the heart of anyone who's ever gripped a video game controller or dropped a quarter into an arcade cabinet. In 1962, MIT became the birthplace of the world's first video game, Space War, a game that helped the whole world to realize the true creative potential of computers. It all began in 1962, when the MIT alums behind the Upstart Digital Equipment Corporation, or DEC, decided to donate one of the company's new PDP-1 model minicomputers as a gift to the alma mater. This closet-sized computer was available to students for more than just scientific research, and, unlike most computers at the time, users could sit at the PDP-1's terminal and interact with it in real time, rather than submitting a batch of punch cards to a system administrator and waiting hours, if not days, for the results. In time, Hackers drawn to the PDP-1 began to explore the creative dimensions of computing in a way that had never been done before. It's a, uh, it's a large machine. It's not the type of machine that people fooled around on, uh, which is why it was uh, unusual and a special opportunity for people to uh, develop things like Space War and other recreational computing um, on, on that sort of system. The people who were working in Space War were regularly communicating with the people in DEC. Anyway, first of all, you are in the same state, you are practically pr 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 in the same city, and there's a lot of MIT alums in, 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 DEC, in DEC. In fact, the PDP-1 itself was donated by DEC. So, you know, this was not a machine that was purchased by MIT. Um, this was a gift uh, just to see what MIT will do with it. So, um, by, uh, by having this, you know, um, early model, which is, they, you know, sort of said, oh yeah, take it and do whatever you like. Um, uh, I think a lot of the creativity that led on to programming on the PDP-1, the attitude that, hey, we should be able to program interactively, we should be able to do fun things with this system, right, was, was fostered um, by that particularity, by, uh, by the way the, the TIXO functioned. Um, of course, um, you know, having a PDP-1 was not, and, and being allowed to do um, superfluous things on it, you know, was not common uh, in other places around the world, so, um, so that was also significant. Most of the hackers who built Space War were members of the Tech Model Railroad Club, a student-run society of enthusiasts and tinkerers that in the early 1960s operated out of the now legendary Building 20. Building 20 was um, a ramshackle, uh, quickly, roughly constructed building in World War II designed specifically for the research of radar. It was called the Radiation Lab. Um, and parts of it uh, was still used for research all the way up to the 90s, actually. And parts of it were used by student organizations like the Tech Model Railroad Club. So right now the Tech Model Railroad Club has moved, but that's where they had their model railroad set up and all of their spare parts, some of which were used to build the controllers for Space War. I mean, I see this, the context of Space War emerged out of, you know, a significant part of that was the, uh, the Tech Model Railroad Club, TMERC, um, which uh, still has a nice uh, layout um, uh, uh, over by the MIT Museum um, in, in a building uh, on, the, on the north side of campus. Um, that was uh, a place where people, um, not so much for, they didn't, as far as I know, uh, race trains against each other, but they were interested certainly in recreational and uh, enjoyable uses of technology. Um, uh, getting, uh, getting some uh, uh, relays that, um, uh, you know, uh, thanks to um, checking by at uh, telecommunic telecommunications uh, play, uh, companies and, and finding when the, um, uh, there might be uh, some of these extraordinarily expensive relays being discarded and things like this, you know. Uh, being able to develop a really, really um, a sophisticated uh, hardware system um, to, uh, to run model trains. Um, so this is part of the context that this came out of. You've already got a heritage to Space War that's all about tinkering and playing with technology from the Tech Model Railroad Club. These are people who are interested in simulating reality and in some sort of model scale. Uh, who are interested in sort of like seeing how far they can push their, their simulation to look like reality um, and, um, and actively borrowing parts from that in order to build parts of space war. So you've got that same attitude 
towards games in space war, uh, in space war in particular and in games that came up from MIT later which is very much simulation based and the idea that interesting things happen in games if you take some effort to try to accurately represent reality in some way now space war is about two spaceships trying to shoot each other in space right i mean there's like not much realistic at least from a 1962 point of view about that but the gravitational calculations that they're using that actually generate all the really interesting dynamics in the gameplay, those were try don't, don't, they attempt to do that as faithfully as possible. Again, the night sky, you know, they're trying to do that as faithfully as possible to what they knew of, of reality. Uh, nowadays, it's called the first modern video game, and uh, it was a game for two players competing to direct um, these uh, rocket ships, uh, which uh, very, very faithfully uh, obeyed gravitational laws. Uh, against each other, and they would then uh, fire uh, weapons, uh, and uh, the projectiles uh, did not obey the laws of gravity. But there was a in-game explanation for why that was. Uh, there's a star field in the background, and these different components um, of the game were developed by different people. Um, uh, Steve Slug Russell is the main person associated, but there's several others um, who worked on these different components of the game and uh, um, on uh, putting it together. Um, uh, to demonstrate what computers could do in 1962 for uh, people coming to MIT. That the behavior of these two ships could be behavior that the designers never originally intended. Um, and that's a clear winner and loser, uh, which is the person who blows up first is the loser. Uh, these, these are all aspects that you see in uh, video games today. It is amazing the extent to which the game is recognizably a video game, even though there's no video in it. It's you know there's a graphics that there's graphics, but it's not like a TV video screen. Uh, it's not using that technology, but it plays like a two-player Nintendo or Atari game. Yeah. So these are our facsimiles of the game controllers that they made back with Tech Model Railroad parts. Um, and you know it looks like a game controller you know here's your your left stick and your right stick they only go one direction but you know you show this to a kid you know it's like they understand that's the fire button and it's pretty obvious at a time when computers were still seen by most as passive mills meant only to crunch large sets of numbers one batch at a time space war was a deeply interactive richly graphical demonstration of what a computer could do especially when placed in real-time conversation with a pair of active, imaginative users. I would say, so Space War was designed to be both a game and a demonstration of what the deck PDP-1 was capable of doing. I would try to use as many features as possible of that machine um, and sort of right, run it to its processing limit to be able to, to, to wow people and say, you know, hey, look at what this amazing machine can do. Um, it also inadvertently was a really good test on uh, for whether the machine was working properly. So DEC actually, after it was invented, DEC actually used it uh, as a sort of a final factory test on whether the machine that they were about to ship out to a customer was working. And as a result, uh, it became one of the first distributed video games ever um, because anybody who got a new deck machine had Space War preloaded on it. Soon after the earliest versions of Space War were created, word of the hacker's achievement spread through campus like a wildfire, and the game soon developed a vibrant following here at MIT, inaugurating a unique culture of digital gaming that still lives on today. Uh, there are accounts, written accounts in college newspapers about hearing the sound of Space War being played. Now, Space War is a game that is silent. There's no sound effects in there, um, which, mean, which meant you could hear the people playing the game. And, I, and that would be cheering and whoops and I don't know, at, at, at a victory or loss. Um, so, you know, people on the same floor of, I believe it was Building 26, where, uh, where, where the huge room was, was held, certainly knew the game was there. Um, and we have had some accounts from people who have been in MIT since that time talking about playing that game just by basically walking in. One of them had a great account of while, while playing the game, this guy just walks in in the back and talks a, a, and mentions that this is that he's looking at the future. This is this is the um, this is what he's been writing about all the times, but you guys have actually built it. And he turns around and he realizes Isaac Asimov.
So you know, <laughs> give you an idea of the kind of people who knew about space war and had and had the opportunity to play it. it was pretty broad. Space war is a major milestone in the history of computing, and its legacy lives on today. Not just in the campus that gave birth to it, but also in the interactive entertainment media it gave rise to. The the. The spirit that Space World was built in came from more of a tradition of hacking together code and um, open source software in the way how it was distributed and it got more features over time um, than a big media industry uh, influence. It, it wasn't, people didn't make games like they were trying to distribute a movie uh, today. Um, so. So on one hand, I think it's important for for any, for anybody involved in games, and especially in games and universities, to remember that there is a much longer tradition of experimenting with games that um, has nothing to do with packaged goods um, and mass media entertainment. The other thing that's more specific about MIT is just to remind people in MIT, we've been interested in games for a really long time. Talking about a game that comes out in 1962, it has predecessors before that, and it comes out of MIT's own tinkering in gaming culture, uh, of tabletop games, of you know uh, sports, um, games that people will play for re uh, in real life outside of the computer. Um, but when I look at it, I see it as a direct historical connection um, that MIT that never really left MIT. That spirit that created that early game is still here in MIT, and it, it just hasn't marched in lockstep with the entertainment industry that is the game industry today. And I think if we recognize that we've had an unbroken line of experimentation, these playful experiences that you have on computers. Um, that isn't marching to that same beat. We can, in we here in MIT, we can recognize that it's uh, that we have an opportunity to continue to uh, to bring something new to the space of computers and play. Um, that's not informed by um, what the mass market currently wants, but might be really enthralled with in the future. Much in the same way that Space War came out of the blue in 1962. And, uh, and stole everybody on the MIT campus hearts. Um, nobody wanted Space War, but they got it, and then suddenly everybody did.